Well, is it ever going to be an interesting day here at Politics Religion? You won't want to miss it. We're talking about a subject that most people don't know much about, but they need to now more than ever. The subject is liberation theology. Let me give you a little bit of the background of liberation theology. There was a Peruvian theologian by the name of Gustavo Gutierrez. He wrote a book called Theology of Liberation way back in the 1960s, 1970s. Well, the theology of uh, liberation theology took off and gained a lot of momentum throughout South America in the 19, late 50s, 60s, and 70s. Now, in a nutshell, here's what liberation theology says. It says that if Jesus Christ were on earth today, that he actually would be a Marxist. He would take from those that have and give to those that have not. Well, many of the Catholic priests, especially the Jesuits in South America during the 60s and the 70s, took this so literal that some of them actually laid aside their clerical collar, picked up machine guns, and overthrew governments. In particular, this happened in Haiti with Bertrand Aristide, who was a Roman Catholic priest, and it also happened in Nicaragua. Now, here's the way that communists operate. When they're going into a country, they like to adopt one of the heroes of the country. For example, a hero like George Washington or Abraham Lincoln and sort of hook their cause to that hero's cause and that way they immediately have favor with the people. Well, that's what they did in Nicaragua. There was a man by the name of Sandano and he was a very popular hero among the people of Nicaragua. So the communists decided that they would take on the identity of Sandano and they would call themselves the Sandinistas. They combined Sandano with communist and they came up with Sandinista. Well, the Sandinistas began to uh, assault the government of Nicaragua and finally were successful in taking it over. Many of the Catholic priests were the key players in this situation. Well, this, this movement called Liberation Theology content, continued to gain foothold, especially among the Jesuit order of the Roman Catholic Church uh, back in the 60s and the 70s. Now, what's interesting is Pope Francis was the Secretary General of the Jesuits in Argentina, of course, that's in South America, from 73 to 79 during the heyday of liberation theology. As soon as I read this, I wondered, so is this Pope a liberation theologist? Well, back to the story, and we'll get to that answer before we're done today. But back to the story. It was in 1978. I was driving through the city of Chicago. There was a talk show going on on WBBM radio. Well, I immediately was fascinated because the guest had just written a new book. The title of the book was The Final Conclave. Now, a conclave is the election of a pope. So, final conclave means the last ever election of a pope. He immediately had my attention. Then I found out who wrote the book and who was being interviewed, uh, a man by the name of Malachi Martin, who was an intimate friend with Pope John XXIII. He taught at the Vatican College in Rome for six years, wrote 25 books, was a Jesuit priest himself. Okay, so why does he call it the final conclave? Well, this is the story that Malachi Martin uh, told that day on the radio. He said that because communism is becoming such a sweeping movement in our world, and back in the 70s, it looked like communism was going to rule the world, capitalism was on the wane. And so uh, Malachi Martin said there was a belief inside the Roman Catholic Church that the church had to ride this wave and to form an alliance with Marxism or else be destroyed. So the belief was that the next pope needed to be a pro-Marxist pope. 
Pope Paul VI was Pope at the time, but he was terminally ill. Everybody knew it. Well, now they've really got my attention because uh, Malachi Martin said, I believe if we elect a pro-Marxist Pope, the Marxists will use the church to get power and then they will turn and destroy the church and try to set up their atheistic secular society worldwide. That's the Marxist dream. Uh, he said, I believe what we need to do is to elect a pope that will get the church out of politics, return the church to its spiritual mission, and clean up the corruption that is in the church. Well, I went out that very day and bought the book, The Final Conclave, read it. It was a fascinating read. Now, it was, it was couched in fiction with a lot of fact woven in, and especially, I especially understood it since I had heard the interview with the author himself. Well, Pope Paul VI did die about six months after that, and so I was absolutely fascinated to follow the unfolding developments that happened next. Of course, after the funeral of Pope Paul VI, they called their conclave to the Vatican where the cardinals all come to elect the next pope. So the big question was, would Malachi Martin's anti-communist pope that would return the church to its spiritual mission, rid the church of corruption, would he be elected or would the church in fact elect a communist pope in order to forge an alliance with the communist world? Well, it wasn't but a few days and then the news came that a pope was elected and he chose to take the name for his papacy of John Paul I. Well, I'm still trying to figure out, did Malachi Martin's guy win or did the pro-Marxist Pope win? Before I could even figure it out, it was suddenly announced, 33 days later actually, that the Pope died during the night. Well, my alarm bells immediately went off because this Pope was 65 years of age, in perfect health, so has somebody eliminated the Pope? What is this really all about? Well, I didn't have to wait too long because there was a book published by David Yallop called In God's Name. There's another book entitled Pontiff that also was published. And both of these books contended that the Pope was assassinated. Well, let me give you a little bit of the things that happened the very day that he died that night. There was a a cardinal prelate over the Vatican Bank, which handled billions and billions of dollars per year. His name was Paul Marcinkus. And he had actually, uh, a warrant had been issued for his arrest by the Italian government for laundering mob money through the Vatican Bank. However, Marcinkus escaped uh, being arrested by, the, by Italy because he stayed within the walls of the Vatican. And of course, the Vatican is a sovereign state of its own. They couldn't get to him. Well, the news came out that the day he died, the Pope had issued the order that day to remove Paul Marcinkus from being head of the Vatican Bank. Now, in addition to that, a few months before, a story had appeared that Cardinal Cody, the powerful Archbishop of Chicago, had funneled about a million dollars of church money to a woman in Florida. When the story broke, Cardinal Cody said, oh, that's my uh, cousin, needed some help, and so I sent some money to help her. Well, the fact is that proved not to be true, but the story disappeared. Well, the day he died that night, Pope John Paul I, not only did he remove Paul Marcinkus from being the head of the Vatican Bank, but he gave the order for the disciplining of the powerful Archbishop of Chicago, Cardinal Cody. Well, guess what? Neither order was ever carried out. Instead, the Pope died that night. Well, I began to suspect immediately once I saw all that information that Malachi Martin's Pope had won and that he was trying to rid the church of corruption, but his efforts were short-lived. Well, and both In God's Name by David Yallop and also the book Pontiff, both of them stated and gave all kinds of proof that in fact 
the Pope was assassinated. They actually told how it was done. Uh, there is a substance you can put inside of a book when you open it up and it hits you in the face and it gives you all the symptoms of a heart attack, but it kills you. And the Pope died in his bed that night and according to the story, he was reading a book called The Imitations of Christ. Okay, it's time to elect another Pope. So the prelates all come back to the Vatican and in a few days, this white smoke billows from the Sistine uh, Chapel chimney. We have a Pope. They announced the first non-Italian in 400 years, the youngest Pope in a long, long time, and the first Pope ever, get this, from a communist country, Carol Wojtyla, who took the name Pope John Paul II from Poland. His number one claim to fame was that he had not only presided over the church under 40 some years of communism and the church had not only survived, but thrived. I thought, oh my goodness. Now they have their Pope that knows how to make an alliance with communism. Now that's the way it looked to me. Well, time proved that that was in fact true, even though some historians will tell you that he was an enemy of liberation theology. The fact is he was a dyed in the wool socialist. He even said in one article, I'm not going to tell the Soviets we're going to bury them. I'm simply going to tell the Soviets you're going to bury yourself unless we show you how to make socialism work. Well, to make a long story short, he became a very good friend with Mikhail Gorbachev. And he and Gorbachev worked together, the result being the tearing down of the Berlin Wall and the marrying together of Catholicism and communism. Now, I know, I know they all tell you that the fall of the Berlin Wall was the end of the Cold War and the victory of capitalism. But if that's true, why was Gorbachev clapping while the wall fell? And why did he say in his book, Perestroika, many people think Perestroika is the death of communism. I'm sure to tell you that's the furthest thing from the truth. Well, the plot thickens, I'm gonna tell you more because there's something happening this week that is directly related to what happened back there under Pope John Paul II and Gorbachev.